Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Jenkins, and welcome to this uh, fireside chat I'm having with Eric Herakotansis, who is uh, not only a tremendous uh, civil rights attorney, um, but also become a good friend of mine. Um, we're hosting this under the auspices of the uh, film that I produced with Garrett Hubbard called Trapped Cash Bill in America, which is on currently streaming on, streaming on YouTube Originals. And as part of uh, the work that we're doing around the issue of bail reform, we're talking to people uh, who were in the film. Um, and Alec uh, was actually one of the reasons why the film got made uh, almost three, more than three years ago. I think in the summer of 2017, we met uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and had a long conversation about some of the work that he's done around um, cash bail and dismantling uh, the cash bail system through the law. And uh, it took us a year and a half or so to get him in front of the camera. We finally did. Um, but uh, some of the response to the film, which has been overwhelming, um, has been really about Alex's comments and thoughts and work around um, bringing a new perspective on how to really think about uh, the criminal punishment system, as he calls it. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about um, his book that came out a little bit more than a year ago. Is that right, Alec? About November 2019? Yeah. Um, right. it's, it's called Usual Cruelty, um, the Complicity of Lawyers in the Criminal Justice System. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with Al to do a deep dive on his book is good. not only does it um, really square well with the work that uh, Garrett and I did um, with our film uh, on cash bail, but um, it really deepens um, the, the understanding of folks who want to do something about um, this sort of a just system and not only the system of cash bail, but also uh, just how the criminal punishment system and what many people call the criminal injustice system really is at its DNA, at its granular level. Um, and so Alex's work um, over his 10, 15 years in the profession really has looked at how to think more rigorously about uh, the criminal uh, punishment system, and his book is a reflection of that. Um, and so our chat today is going to be a lot largely about his book, his work, um, how it jobs with um, some of his work around cash bail around the country, but also really a, a deeper dive into how we can think more rigorously about criminal justice reform, um, how we think about criminal, just, criminal justice system, uh, how we think about the rule of law, how we think about crime itself. These are all things that Alec uh, goes into in his book and I uh, really uh, feel blessed to be able to talk uh, with you, Alec, today about your work and sort of go more deeply into some of the things that we couldn't go into in the film by having this conversation today. So, so thanks very much for, for joining me uh, today on, uh, on this chat. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's a wonderful opportunity to talk with you. And I hope folks also get the chance to check out the movie, which now has, what, 2.7 million views on YouTube and is really doing a wonderful job of just getting some of the basics about this horrific um, system of cash bail that is causing so many people and families pain all over the country. And it's a really great service that you and Garrett did making that film. Yeah, so and so and not only that, you can see Alec once again. Two point seven million people have seen Alec in his in his role as um, as one of our real great experts in the shows in the movie. So, um, but just starting out, just in terms of uh, the book, Alec, I just wanted to just start with the title, um, "Usual Cruelty," um, and so you obviously named it for a particular reason. Um, you know, using the turning the phrase on unusual cruelty is what we usually hear. Um, what was the, the thing or the entity that encapsulates this phrase, usual cruelty? What are you really talking about when you say usual cruelty? So many of the people who, who don't get to um, experience the criminal system um, day to day, um, and so many people who aren't forced to be subjected to it um, every single day, don't, I think, have any understanding of the incredible pain and trauma that it's inflicting on people's minds and their bodies and their families and their communities. So we're talking about a system that right now, as you and I are talking, cages 2.3 million human beings. Um, and these cages um, aren't uh, randomly uh, distributed uh, among the population, right? We're talking about a system that targets black people and targets poor people. We cage black people at a rate six times that of South Africa at the height of apartheid. All of this has become so normalized. Um, when you think about what a system has to do, a bureaucracy 
um, was created to process 11 million arrests every single year. And that's 11 million human beings that are taken away from their schools and their churches and their jobs and their families and their communities and their loved ones. And they're put into this government run cages of concrete and metal. And we have allowed through our indifference, these cages to become grotesque torture chambers where people are likely to be sexually and physically assaulted to be deprived of the basic things that you and I take for granted, Chris, every single day, like nutritious food, fresh air, sunlight. In many of the most prominent jails around the country in, in, in the downtown areas of many major cities, the windows in our jails are fake. Um, it's more important to us to see a nice building with windows than it is to have sunlight reaching the people on the inside. People are getting um, missing mental health treatment. Um, people are, 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 are contracting infectious diseases, um, easily preventable disease. So all of these things are happening every single day, immense pain and cruelty. And I haven't even gotten to the millions of people who are separated from their children in 3,163 local jails on any given night in this country, just because they can't pay cash bail. Um, so this is the reality of our criminal punishment bureaucracy. And yet, Almost none of the things that it does every single day um, at scale in, in assembly line fashion um, are thought of as unjust. You know, when I started challenging the cash bail system several years ago, people laughed at me and they said, well, we use cash bail in every single major American jurisdiction. It can't be illegal. It can't be unconstitutional. That is the power of normalization. So many of us lawyers in particular have allowed ourselves to become desensitized to things that should shock us to the core, like cash bail, the subject of your movie. Um, so for me, the title, Usual Cruelty, was about trying to capture a system that is inflicting cruelty on such a scale, um, unprecedented really in the modern recorded history of the democratic world, um, that, it, that cruelty no longer feels cruel, it feels utterly usual. And you were a... Um a public defender in Washington, D.C. when you started your career, right? And then um, here in, in Washington, right, for five or six years, um, and then went on to um, do to open up Civil Rights Corps, um, your founder and, um, and CEO there, where you're doing a lot of this work. Um, but what during your career, maybe even started in law school, got you thinking about this concept? Were there experiences that you had uh, with individuals here in Washington or um, as you uh, began to challenge the constitutionality uh, of cash bail and, and really do some really innovative work? Um, were there individual cases um, or was this a culmination of some of the work that you had maybe started in law school or um, or some of the work you did, um, you know, defending people here in, in DC. Talk to us a little bit about what the sort of the flesh and around the bones that led to this concept you came up with in terms of people that you interacted with every day. Well, actually, uh, my first job after after um, finishing my clerkship after law school was as a public defender in Alabama, oh. mm -hmm. and and after that, I moved to, to Washington D.C as a public defender for, for four and a half years. And it, that process um, of representing the human beings who our government is accusing of crimes and trying to cage was a very formative one. And I could tell any number of, of stories, but you can't help but be um, exposed to that system. You can't help but, but feeling like it's, it's causing so much senseless pain. Um, for all of the human caging that our society has embarked on, and, and we now cage people at five times our own historical average of just 40 years ago, um, there has never ever been any empirical evidence that it does anyone any good. So you think just for example about the kind of case that, that I saw most often as a public defender was people who are accused of possessing an illegal drug. By that I mean a substance that the government has said, we're gonna put this substance on a list and if someone possesses something on this list, we can put them in a cage. And keep in mind, um, every substance that made it onto that list throughout our country's history did so for very particular reasons. Um, in the 19th century, opium and its derivatives are put on the list for the purpose of targeting and controlling and surveilling and arresting and caging and imprisoning the Chinese American population. Um, cocaine put on the list and, and extraordinarily harsh penalties um, done for the very particular reason of, 
of giving police more discretion to cage and control and arrest and, 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 and brutalize black people. Marijuana put on the list for the very purpose of controlling and caging Mexican Americans. I could go on and on and on. Um, you see this in a very real way when you're a public defender. You have to ask yourself questions like, why are we separating this woman from her child for seven or eight or nine years because she possessed this plant? Is anyone any better off? Is the system actually serving its goals? You look at the war on drugs more broadly, we've spent trillions of dollars on it. We've surveilled the entire global population and captured cell phone calls and emails. We have, we have destroyed rainforests throughout Latin America. We have arrested tens of millions of people, separated tens of millions of children from their parents. We have killed so many human beings, particularly tens of thousands of black people in this country. When you add all of that up and, and many more harms that, that, that have come from, from the war on drugs, including the extraordinary theft uh, and extraction of poor people's property through a mechanism called civil forfeiture, when you add all of that up, and then you look and you see that drug usage rates are the same or higher in many places than they were when the war on drugs commenced, you have to ask yourself, are the people who are involved in the system who are creating it, are they just stupid? Do they just not understand that the criminalization of these substances actually doesn't even solve whatever goal they thought they were gonna solve, if you can measure that goal and the number of, of people using that substance? I don't think so. I don't think it's that the entire bureaucracy and apparatus and people in power are stupid. I just think that their goals are very different from the goals that they tell us. Their goals are not what they, this sort of vague notion of public safety, right? Their goals are controlling and brutalizing and keeping in check in a permanent state of what Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow. Um, uh, that is, is the only reasonable way one who, who works and lives and experiences this system, that's the only reasonable conclusion one can draw from all of the different data points that you see over the course of many years. When I was, when I was a public defender, I thought to myself, I, I would like to be part of a broader movement of people you know, led by the people who are most directly impacted by these systems to fundamentally challenge some of the basic assumptions we're making about human caging and about what it does to us, all of us. Um, and because I think human caging has a very profound effect on all people, including the people that, that, that think that they're benefiting from caging and brutalizing so many other people. So I wanted to be part of something different. And so I started uh, doing this work, uh, civil rights work, working with communities and people around the country who are in jail cells every single night and fighting that and, and using their stories to try to change more broadly the narrative about what is our criminal punishment system for? What is it doing and why? And, and that's really how I came in particular to the cash bail work, which I can talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but one thing you mentioned, and this is the thing that I think I really want to part, uh, really focus on for the next part of our conversation is how your book and how your thoughts on this um, have to do with really with the DNA or challenging the DNA that we sort of take for granted uh, in the criminal justice system, for lack of a better term, or the criminal, criminal punishment system, as you call it. Um, because you, you know, spend a significant amount of time in your book and in, in writing about these notions of rule of law and crime that we've been told essentially are these objective things that sort of flow from some universal truth, but actually are um, you know, political decisions that have been made over time. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, the drugs, you know, various different drugs were put on various different lists for, for not for objective reasons, but for very subjective reasons about who the government at any particular time wanted to control. Um, but what I want you to talk about in this next question is really why you call, for example, the rule of law a myth. Um, and you have a nice explanation of why, um, you know, the rule of law is not something that is just something that sort of came from the Bible or some celestial place that somehow was, was descended upon us, but that it was something that was constructed. Um, and in fact, I mean, some of one of your more powerful graphs, you call it, it's trickery that, you know, the rule of law is a trickery that lawyers themselves have sort of taken upon themselves to repeat without perhaps even knowing exactly that the rules in which they're playing by are not necessarily these things that are truly objective. So, so can you tell me a little bit about why you, you, what your notions are about the rule of law, why you call it a myth and why you call it trickery? 
I think the first key is to understand that the rule of law, just like the law generally, is context dependent. It depends on um, the very particular power relationships that exist in a society at any given time. Just so just take an example from our history, um, it was the rule of law in this country that, that people could own other people. Um, the entire system of slavery was the law of the land, right? Um, Jim Crow was the law of the land. Um, women couldn't vote and that was the law of the land. And so, um, you know, you can, you, can, you can give examples like that throughout uh, even more recent history, right? So um, it was the law of the land uh, throughout this country that, that uh, you couldn't marry someone that you were in love with if that person happened to be the same sex as you. Uh, so the, the law is, is a reflection of the choices and desires of people in a society who have power. That's a very important thing to understand because when you look back at the history of the American courts, you'll see that the courts have constantly ruled for and been on the side of the powerful. It was the courts that came out with the Dred Scott decision. It was the courts that did Plessy versus Ferguson. It was the courts that said women couldn't vote, right? Um, that didn't apply the 14th Amendment to women. Um, at every single turn, um, courts are just reflecting in, in many respects the power dynamics of that particular society. And the same is true in the criminal law. Um, so just to take a, a few examples from the criminal law, um, it is a crime in most of the country to, to possess in your hand the marijuana plant. Um, the same is not true of the tobacco plant. Even though the tobacco plant kills 480,000 Americans every single year. It kills 41,000 people every single year from secondhand smoke alone. These are not even people who choose to smoke tobacco. That's 15 September 11th every single year just from secondhand smoke. And yet it is the rule of law and the law of the land that tobacco is perfectly legal. So um, something else is going on when we're deciding what to make a crime and what not to make a crime. There are other considerations. Like for example, in the 1990s, um, a bunch of corporate bankers got together and decided they wanted to make certain forms of high-tech gambling legal. They called them derivatives. They managed to convince Congress and Bill Clinton to sign a law um, decriminalizing certain forms of high-tech trading and gambling. It actually led to the, the housing and foreclosure crisis. And yet, at the same time, um, gambling in the streets over dice was still illegal for poor people. Right? So these notions of what constitutes illegal gambling, totally socially constructed. I could go on and on, and I give about two or 300 examples in the book, um, which I think are very <laughs> interesting, very telling in their own right. But the broader point with the rule of law is not just um, what the law says, it's how is the law enforced? People who are controlling our society and elite people and wealthy people, they want you to think that there's this, some kind of a myth, mythical, objective, neutral rule of law, and that if, the, if someone breaks the law, we must enforce the law against them. But keep in mind that almost none of the crimes that are committed in our society on a daily basis are ever prosecuted. Um, police only investigate some crimes committed by some people in some neighborhoods some of the time. So when I was in college at Yale, for example, underage drinking and drug use, sexual assault was rampant on campus. Everybody knew it, right? Um, at one point, 20 to 25% of people, who were women at, at Yale were sexually assaulted. Um, uh, the same was true, uh, I think it was about 95% of people admitted to some form of drug use or underage drinking, right? Um, at the same, and, and I never saw uh, police intervene in any way on any of those issues on the Yale campus. However, right down the street in, in New Haven, in black communities, in poor communities, police were absolutely brutally enforcing the very same laws against different people, had less oh, famous people and rich people and wealthy people who tend to go to a school like Yale. Now, obviously I could give another hundred examples of how this happens, right? Um, every single day across the country, um, employers engage in wage theft to a tune of 50 to $100 billion a year. Um, almost none of them ever prosecuted. I don't I don't think there were any wage theft prosecutions last year in this country. That amount of wage theft is about 10 times that of all other theft, shoplifting, robbery, burglary combined. It's a choice that police and prosecutors are making to prosecute poor people for shoplifting 
and not the large corporate retailers for wage theft of those same poor people's wages. And these are the kinds of decisions that are constantly being made throughout the, 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 the spectrum of our criminal law. And, and rich people, wealthy people, um, you know, disproportionately white people who own things, they don't want you to think that this is uh, biased and that this is something they're doing to preserve their own position and wealth and power, right? They want you to think that it's objective. And so they've concocted this myth of the rule of law um, so that people think that, oh, it must be my fault if I broke a law, I'm gonna get prosecuted for it. Um, when many of the people, most of the people every single day who are breaking laws aren't getting prosecuted at all. I mean, so that, that's one of the, you know, this is one of those books I have right here, by the way, here it is, um, you know, if I have marked this book up, you know, particularly the first hundred pages, you know, um, it's like, you know, a Christmas tree in here with all the red and green that I've marked up because, you know, some of those things that I think most of us kind of generally, when you're saying that we're nodding our heads, I'm sure in the audience, like, yeah, that's right. But, but I think the specificity with which um, you point these things out um, really rings true in a way that almost is obviously infuriating. Um, but one of the things that you do is you also turn back to the legal community to say that there isn't a rigor enough, rigorous enough um, an, uh, analysis of the things that law students and lawyers are doing every day, um, that there's an acceptance um, of the way things are um, as a way of broadening the criminal punishment system. Um, and so uh, one of the questions I had for later, but I think I'll ask for you now is, what is the legal uh, community's responsibility um, in your estimation to change the way in which it thinks about uh, these things like the rule of law when they're so embedded um, in our notions of what it means to be an American? Such a good question. And I, I don't actually think it's just a responsibility of those in the legal community. I think it's a responsibility of all of us because after all, what's happening to people and their families in the criminal system, what you do such a great job of showing in your movie Trap uh, about the bail system, it's, it's, we're all complicit in it. It's our own indifference and lack of engagement with it that is allowing all of this to happen in our name. It's our local elected officials that are doing it. It's our bureaucratic apparatuses that are doing it. It's our money that is paying for it. So um, I, I do think that, that, that lawyers have a very particular um, responsibility and culpability for this system, which I'll, I'll describe you know, really briefly. Um, number one, um, one of the most incredible things about um, my time in the legal profession is the extent to which there is a gap between the way our law is written and idealized and talked about, like, you know, on top of the Supreme Court, it says equal justice under law, right? Um, this is it on the top of an institution that has um, for its entire existence sided with the powerful over the powerless. Um, these are really important myths. Um, we also have things like the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. We have things like the Due Process Clause. We have the First Amendment. We have all of these theoretical protections. And yet every single day in our legal system, there is an incredible gap between that, that sort of ideal and the reality of how the law is being inflicted and perpetrated um, and sort of abused to crush poor people and particularly black people. Um, and so that gap is something that I've been fascinated by my entire career because lawyers simultaneously articulate these lofty principles and yet are the ones uh, every single day um, creating and rationalizing and justifying a system that everybody knows does not live up to those principles at all. So, you know, there is a right to a zealous lawyer if you're accused of a crime in this country. Every single lawyer, you no, know, and the Attorney General of the United States has said this over the course of multiple different administrations, everybody knows that's a total joke. We, we are not giving adequate legal counsel to hardly anyone who's accused of a crime in this country, if you're poor. Um, the same is true with the money bail system. Everyone understands that no human being should be caged because she can't make a cash payment. And yet there's 450,000 human beings sitting in cages right now as you and I are talking just because they can't make a cash payment. Um, on and on and on, we could 
we could talk about the ways in which the legal system fails to live up to its own basic values. And I, I think lawyers um, have a lot of the blame for that. We, we have to be more rigorous in our thinking about how do we actually create a legal system that lives up to our values. And we have not done that as a profession. I do want to take a pause from uh, some of the um, the philosophical intellectual things that you're talking about. And I, I want to come back to those. And I do just want to get back to some of the work um, that we uh, somewhat explore in the film. Um, but again, it's one of those things you're looking at the cutting room floor, like I wish we could put that back in and just sort of show more about what Alex up to and what so many other people in the film, like Mary and others are up to. Cause we only, you know, we only had so much ability to put everything in, but, um, but one of the things that, one of the responses that I got a lot about your work um, after from folks who saw the film was this whole notion of um, challenging uh, cash bail at, you know, on the federal, you know, or constitutional, the constitutional uh, rigor that you took to challenging cash bail all over the country. Um, and at the time we talked, we had, uh, you talk a little bit about your work in California, your work in Texas, obviously, your work in, um, uh, in Chicago and Illinois and other places. Um, can you, because we weren't able to go in this in the film, I actually would like to hear a little bit, and I think folks might be interested also about how it, it you know, this has been around forever. I mean, cash bill has been going on for years. You know, we have a quote from Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s, who, in the 1960s who, who illustrated that, you know, back in 50 years ago, we knew that there was an issue. No one had come up with this real sort of strategy until you came along um, and started challenging cash bill on the constitutional level in big jurisdictions and small jurisdictions, from the Harris counties, which is the fourth largest jail in the country, to the small institution, small jurisdictions in Alabama. Um, how, when did it dawn on you that there was something amiss about the way in which um, cash bail not only was being used, but that, the, that the, uh, it was a violation of the federal constitution, both 14th and some other people would argue this 8th and the 6th. So just talk to us a little bit about Storify for us, how you came to do this remarkable work around the country um, to really challenge cash bail on a constitutional level. I think um, from the very first moment I saw cash bail being set in a law student in a criminal court in Boston, it struck me as absolutely ludicrous. The idea that someone could be kept in a cage because they couldn't make a $50 payment, a $100 payment. Um, I write about it a little bit in the book. But um, I didn't uh, start working on that system for years afterward. Um, and it was really, you know, the, the moment that I there's a very particular set of moments where I thought um, we could start challenging this system. Because uh, I think there's a difference between identifying something as very unfair and unjust and thinking through a real plan for attacking it. And I, I was in Ferguson after the murder of Michael Brown and um, building a really massive case against the city of Ferguson, which when I got there averaged about 3.6 arrest warrants per household, almost all of the arrest warrants for black people and almost all of them for unpaid debt. And it was very similar to a case I had just won in Alabama um, where people were being caged and separated from their children because they couldn't pay old traffic tickets. And we were starting to have a lot of success in the legal community making the argument that if someone can't pay a fine or a court cost or a ticket, um, you can't jail them just because they're too poor to pay it. And that was a very basic legal principle that the Supreme Court had articulated maybe five decades before Michael Brown was murdered. And, and yet, when I got to Ferguson, it turned out that thousands and thousands and thousands of people were being targeted and, and brutalized and caged by the city of Ferguson for, for just that. And when we started bringing these claims in Alabama and Louisiana and Mississippi and Tennessee and Missouri, um, everyone was agreeing with us. All of these judges, conservative and liberal, they were saying, yeah, of course you can't put someone in a cage because they, they owe a ticket um, just because they're poor. Um, there has to be other ways of, of handling um, those situations. And it occurred to me at that moment that, um, you know, because the very, the same concept is the very foundation of the American money bail system, except the only difference is that this is pre-trial rather than after you've been convicted and you owe a fine. This is pre-trial before you're even convicted of anything. The very same principle must apply. And 
um, spent many months sort of figuring out how to get around a lot of the very particular legal obstacles the courts have concocted to prevent themselves from doing justice and hearing cases. And we were able to come up with a way of getting into court and forcing the courts to confront the gap between um, the legal values, which say, um, you can't jail someone just because they're poor. If you want to jail someone, you have to have extremely good reasons for it. Uh, it has to be absolutely necessary. And the reality of millions of human beings every single year jailed and separated from their families and children just because they couldn't pay cash bail. So you know, it was really sometime in the fall of 2014, as I was spending a lot of time in Ferguson after the murder of Michael Brown, that, that I really started thinking in earnest about this. And then we brought the first challenge to the modern money bail system under equal protection and due process grounds on January 15th, 2015. And what's remarkable about what you just said is that there are all these people um, in the criminal punishment system, whether they were judges or I don't know if it was prosecutors too, but you mentioned both liberal and conservative judges who agreed with you. Like, yeah, of course, even though they have been doing it anyway. Um, it sounds like to me, I mean, I, I, you didn't say that exactly, but that's what I'm assuming is that they were participating in this process, even though they knew that, you know, it violated certain tenants and maybe that's not their job to stop. I don't know, you tell me. I mean, it seems like to me it would be there if they knew this was unconstitutional and not, you know, permissible, that they should have not been doing it. But maybe that was, they're waiting for someone like you to come along. And so I guess the question is, how, and I think I asked you this, three and a half years ago, like just sort of incredulous, like, well, what have people, what have attorneys and people, what have people been doing all this time if everybody knew that this was, you know, a blatant violation of the mo one of the most hallowed amendments in the constitution, the 14th, after the first and the second, probably the 14th is the one that people know the most, um, is the 14th amendment, uh, equal protection. So um, harking back to our other part of our conversation about what's, you know, the, the lack of rigor in the system um, and how you confronted it, obviously, when you started doing this work, I guess the question is, you know, first of all, how, and I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you three and a half years ago, how is it that it took so long for this to become a thing that someone like you could figure out? Why wasn't there someone in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, early aughts who figured this out? Well, um, I, I think there were lots of people who figured it out. Um, lots of people were, were pushing back against it. And um, I don't think we have any special access to that necessarily. I think, and I think there's a lot of uh, reasons for the failure of the legal profession to do anything about it in, in, in anything significant about it. Uh, I'll just offer a couple of thoughts. Because um, I don't think what we were doing was all that novel. It's not a really novel idea to say you can't cage someone because they're poor. Um, right. So I don't think we deserve any credit for that whatsoever. Um, my first observation is that um, if there's anything that that many of the mass atrocities in modern world history has taught us, it's that ordinary people are capable of going along with incredible injustice. It doesn't make any individual person or lawyer a bad person um, necessarily, right? Um, but we all have within us, particularly when we're, the, when we're part of a larger system and a larger bureaucracy, we all have the ability to do extraordinary evil. Sometimes we don't even notice what, what we're doing is evil. And you know whether it's things like um, uh, the current modern American criminal system, which is unspeakably evil and causes incredible harm, or the Jim Crow segregation era that preceded it. Um, many ordinary people uh, went along with those systems. And I think it's wrong to think of every single person that didn't do anything about Jim Crow or that didn't, didn't fight the criminal punishment bureaucracy now as, as a bad person. It has to do with the, the collection of um, stories and myths that our culture tells itself about why we're doing this thing that we're doing. It has to do with the very powerful economic incentives that some very powerful people have to keep this system functioning the way that it functions. Let me just give you maybe the best example. Um, 
or you know, a good example among many. Over the last few years, some of the largest telecom companies in the country um, have um, decided that they can make a tremendous amount of money um, by monetizing the contact between people who are incarcerated and their loved ones. And what those telecom companies have done is they've essentially offered payments to local cities and jails and sheriffs and police chiefs. And they said, if you remove in-person visits at your local jail or prison, we will give you a kickback for all of the phone and video revenue that we get. And we'll charge people higher rates um, to speak to their loved ones on the phone. Okay, And so almost every single jurisdiction around the country now has a for-profit company controlling the phone lines that dictate where um, individuals can speak to their loved ones, to their daughter, to their son, to their mother, their father, their lover, um, their partner, their friends. Um, if you want to talk to someone, you have to pay a multi-billion dollar corporation. And that money then gets kicked back to the sheriffs and the police chiefs and the jails, who then in turn think we can make more money if we stop people from being able to visit with each other and they'll call each other more. Okay. Um, this is family separation. This is the kind of thing that people got upset with the Trump administration for doing at the border, right? Although many of the same people weren't complaining when the Obama administration was doing many of the same things at the border, right? We all have these, this ability to tell ourselves these powerful myths. And so how did it come to be that virtually every single sheriff and every single police chief and every single city jail and every single um, corrections officer around the country is participating in a system that is charging mothers to talk to their children just because the mother is too poor to pay cash bail to get out of jail. And for those mothers that are too poor to pay for a phone call, they are not even permitted to speak to their children. And all of us in 3000 jurisdictions are participating in this. Mm -hmm. And, and so it, it's, how do you think about um, the atrocities on that level? Um, and it doesn't work to just vilify everybody who's involved. You have to have an understanding that good people can be part of really horrific systems. And so one of the things that I think is very important in the current discourse, as in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and way too many other black people uh, at the hands of police, that we don't fall into the pattern of, of calling some of the cops bad cops and some of the cops good cops. We have to start asking really serious questions about the institution of American policing. How is it the case that um, af after decades and decades of the same stuff happening, um, we are still in a position where um, no reform that's ever been tried has worked? And what does that say about the actual function of American policing? We also have to understand that much of what the police are doing that is causing pain is not the things that make it onto the news every night. It's the separation of families every single day because they can't pay cash bail or because they um, uh, uh, owe money on court debts. You know, the largest police, the, the biggest, single biggest police arrest in many jurisdictions is driving on a suspended license. And there's 11 million people in this country who lost their license, not because they're bad drivers, but because they owe debts. That is the bulk of what police do. And so it doesn't help to talk about some of those cops being good cops or bad cops. From the perspective of the mother who's separated from her child because she can't pay to have a driver's license but needs to go to work, um, it doesn't matter if it's a good cop that's separating you from your child. We have to rethink these institutions more broadly. Yeah. I want you to save just that stat again because that was astounding to me in this book. And again, I, you know these things and then you see them in print in the context in which you put them in. It is just, you know... Yes, it's infuriating and all these things, but it really does sort of do that matrix thing where it bends your mind a little bit. So the you just mentioned the the suspended license stat. Just say that again, just to, just to sort of hammer that hammer that away. Yeah, so there are about eleven million people whose driver's licenses have been suspended around the country, and forty percent of them are suspended just because the person owes debt. And this is in many jurisdictions the single or one of the top couple uh, uh, offenses of arrest by police, what police spend most of their time doing. Um, if you look at the other top arrests by police, it's things like trespassing, typically charged against people who, are, who, who don't have a home to go to, um, drug possession, right? 
these are what the police spend most of their time on. If you actually look at the FBI statistics, only 5% of all US police arrests are for things the FBI calls serious violent crime. 95% of, of what police do is not that. And, and yet when you ask police, why do we need you? Why do we have you? Why do you exist? They constantly start talking about violent crime, violent crime, violent crime. That's almost none of what they spend their money or time on. And it's, it's propaganda like that and myths like that, the myth of the bad cop, um, that the bad cop is the one that's, that's causing all this trouble, right? Um, that we, that we don't, don't focus on the institution and the structures, focus on the bad individuals. Um, it's really the same in reverse with, with how police want us to talk about crime. They, they see violence in a neighborhood and they want to blame individual bad people for it, right? Instead of asking like, what are the social conditions that lead to people living in this way um, that leads to some of the things that you call crime? And it's this, this focus on the, the individual as opposed to the system that is really one of the, the main targets of my book. Yeah. So um, we have some questions in the chat and a lot of them have to do with criminal justice reform. And you have um, talked, you, talk, you write a lot about criminal justice reform, the efforts, the people who are in charge of it. Um, in your book. And I want to read just a short passage from the book because um, I think your discussion of this whole notion of criminal justice reform will help our audience think a little bit about what they're hearing from both federal and local officials when they talk, when they hear the notion of criminal justice reform and is it really reform? So um, in, in, in the beginning of your book, you write, the emerging quote unquote criminal justice reform consensus is superficial and deceptive. It is superficial because most proposed reforms would still leave the United States as the greatest incarcerator in the world. It is deceptive because those who want largely to preserve the current punishment bureaucracy by making just enough tweaks to protect its perceived legitimacy must obfuscate the difference between changes that will transform the system and tweaks that will curb only its most grotesque flourishes. So, and you have a you know, really interesting sort of look at some of the folks who now consider themselves reformers, including our Vice President-elect um, Kamala Harris, um, our former Attorney General Eric Holder, um, and the whole slew of people who could call themselves progressive um, prosecutors that, you know, what they have done over time and what they choose, what they have saying they want to do in the future really isn't reform. Um, that it's it, because it's coming from people who have an invested stake in the establishment and the continuation of the bureaucracy. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your concerns about the, the sort of the way in which the criminal justice reform conversation has been sort of pushed by the mainstream media and how we need to poke holes in uh, some of the things we see as being propagated as reform? Yeah, so this is really one of the main reasons I wrote the book. And, and you know, for more in-depth thoughts, I would really encourage you to take a look at the book. By the way, I just should just mention, um, none of the royalties from the book go to me. All of the royalties go to an incredible organization called the SE Justice Group, it's E-S-S-I-E, -S -S -E, which is a, a very important organization started by my dear friend, Gina Clayton Johnson. You all um, love Gina. Yes, and Chris knows Gina as well. Um, that organi the organization organizes women who have incarcerated loved ones to build a loving and powerful community to try to change the way the criminal system works. And so um, if you have a book club and, and, and you want a book, new book tree, you should read my book in the book club and you'll be supporting uh, Gina's incredible organization. Um, and, and so um, I talk about this a lot more in the book, but just you know, very briefly, um, most of the, the the same people who created and profited and benefited from the criminal punishment bureaucracy um, are the ones still in power who are now offering reforms. And I think of it as, as sort of, they see this fire burning. Um, people are beginning to see what the real criminal system is all about. And there's this real energy and fire for reform. And what I think a lot of these folks are doing is they're like firefighters, they're burning the edges around the fire so that it doesn't get too crazy. Um, so it doesn't engulf the whole system and just does very particular things that are gonna be enough to pacify people and distract them so that 
most of what the criminal system is doing can keep going. And so the, after Michael Brown's murder and for years, um, the main reform that was being offered around the country was body cameras for the police. What, what no one told you is that this is something the police and police unions have been wanting for years. They just couldn't get the budget to pay for it um, because it's hundreds of millions of dollars to outfit all these cops around the country with cameras. Why do the police want them? Well, because by spending a lot of money on body cameras, first, the police control that footage. It's outward looking. It looks at you, not at the police, right? Um, even when police are caught on camera doing something wrong, there are hardly ever any, any um, consequences or accountability for them. It's an incredible tool of surveillance. When you combine their body cameras with facial recognition software, it's a whole new frontier for police. And many liberal people who, who care about police violence were suckered into supporting this reform for body cameras when it was the police unions who wanted it in the very first place, right? They wanted that hundreds of millions of dollars for new technology for their officers, technology they could use to surveil and control and use as evidence in court against the mostly poor, mostly black people that they prosecuted. So that's just one small example of how when you see punishment bureaucrats advocating reform, they're typically reforms that send more resources to police for better training, more equipment, um, you know, that kind of thing. Not asking questions like, why are the police doing this at all? Why do we have them here? Why do we need them to deal with mental health issues? Um, what other alternatives could we do in our neighborhoods like safe housing and mental health treatment and medical care and after school programs and music and theater and art and poetry for children? All of these things that we could be doing in these neighborhoods that are actually associated with less of what police call crime. Um, you don't see these punishment bureaucrats advocating for that. You see them advocating for the same old um, types of solutions. Another big one in the bail context is replacing money bail with pretrial detention. So instead of being detained because you're poor, um, you're now detained because some algorithmic tool says that you're dangerous. Now, of course, the data on which we're basing dangerousness is based on prior interactions with police which of course itself is based on race and class. And so these are all just different labels on the same old oppression. And now, you know, the sort of the, the icing on the cake is that now that we're being successful around the country challenging the cash bail system, the multi-billion dollar interests behind the bail bond industry are just changing the facade in their business. So instead of selling you the bail bond, they're gonna be selling you a GPS monitor and a drug test. And so they'll be making the same amount of money off the same people. So the kinds of reforms I try to focus on in the book are reforms that actually shrink the size of this bureaucracy, shrink the opportunities for people to make money off of it. And, and that's what we really need to focus on. Um, not making phone calls from jail cheaper so that the billionaire owner of the Detroit Pistons who owns the largest prison telecom company uh, can make you know, a few less dollars every single day off of poor people, but actually asking questions like, why are people in cages? Why are we charging people to talk to their loved ones? What interest is all of this serving? Um, who's benefiting from it? Who, who's being destroyed by it? Um, these are the big questions that the punishment bureaucrats don't want you asking yourself. Um, I'm gonna parry it to a question we got. Um, just tweak it a little bit. The question is what local elections and positions should we keep an eye on that have a direct impact on criminal justice reform? Um, I want to tweet that question because you have a perhaps a different standard about what criminal justice reform looks like than perhaps uh, the mainstream. Are there any places where this robust conversation that you're hoping that folks around the country ha are, need to have, where is it having? Uh, where, where is it being had? Excuse me. I mean, is there any place? I mean, you you mentioned you know Philadelphia, Larry Krasner, and Kim Fox, and some other places where who have who have been tagged as pro progressive prosecutors. You're, you're a little skeptical of whether they're actually progressive. Um, are there places, um, localities where you have seen, um, or there is a conversation around um, some of these more robust um, reform measures that you think are important? I think this is the real beauty and promise of the defund police movement. And what makes it so different from what came before it. Um, after Michael Brown was murdered, a lot of the energy was around, as I mentioned, better training for the cops, um, body cameras, things like that, right? Prosecution of bad cops. 
The defund movement and all of that is premised on the idea that what police are doing is basically good and we just want a few better cops doing that thing, right? Um, I wrote an article in Slate about good cops versus bad cops and I, I wrote an article in Current Affairs magazine called Why Crime Isn't the Question and Police Aren't the Answer. And, and those are both articles that expand on this point in more detail if you're interested. Um, but the, the, the main exciting thing about defund is it's structural. It's asking questions like, why are we devoting resources to this really destructive, um, non-democratic, violent, racist institution um, instead of funding the kinds of things that our communities need to flourish? That is so exciting. And there are groups all over the country locally, whether they're at court watch programs or community bail funds um, or mutual aid networks or groups of, of people who are survivors of serious crime who've come together to say the existing system does not provide us the safety that we need and we want. Um, there, there are so many exciting um, things in every city that I'm seeing that are centered around taking away resources and power from police and jails and handcuffs and tasers and guns, and tanks and grenades, putting that money and resources locally into restorative justice into um, you know, building connections between people in their community through mutual aid, um, to theater and music and poetry and arts programs for children. Um, you name it, there's lots of things that one could be doing without spending money on, on, on police. And, and that's what the promise of defund is. There's a lot of controversy about the slogan defund, but really what's going on there is the idea of divesting from pain and punishment and trauma and investing in the kinds of things all of us know that we want for our children and for our loved ones, the, the kinds of things that make life worth living for our communities, the kinds of things precisely that people in power have divested from in black neighborhoods. And, and that's what defunding the police is really about. So lastly, and there's this great uh, concept that you have in your book called the human lawyer. Um, and I wanna end on this since we're about 10 minutes out. Because I think it's uh, something that, um, you know, I think for lawyers who are listening and for law students who are listening, you know, it's an interesting concept that is synthesized into a back to slogans, um, or at least a, a, a interesting little moniker that says a lot about where you come from as a lawyer, um, an attorney. Um, and what you're almost, it's not my humanitarian, but your, your higher calling is um, as it relates to your, inner, your, your dialectic with the law. Um, could you talk a little bit about the term human lawyer, which uh, you explore a little bit in the book um, and how you came up with it and what it means to you and what it should mean to the legal profession? Yeah, that was a concept I actually came up with when I was in law school back around maybe 2007 or something like that. It was really my attempt to grapple with a legal culture that was so out of touch with what was happening to the most marginalized people in our society in that legal system. And, um, you know, it was a real, it was an attempt on my part to synthesize some of the best parts of what I saw in the law and some of the best parts of what I saw in a lot of the ordinary people I was interacting with and you know, taking the best parts of ourselves and bringing them into the law and taking the best parts of the law and bringing them into our personal lives. So for example, the law is very, pretends to be very rigorous. It's a, it's a discipline whereby um, you have certain principles and values, and then you have certain reasoning process, and you get to certain outcomes. And that can be very good. And I think a lot of people would do well in their own personal lives to, to think really strategically and carefully and critically about um, what are my values? Are the things that I'm doing with my daily life living up to my values? What's the evidence for that? How do I reason to um, positions on issues and um, in, in how I spend my precious time? Um, morally. So I think there's like, we can learn a lot from the rigor that the law is supposed to provide. And yet also the law is not very rigorous at all because it, it glides by so many of the individual emotional um, uh, pain 
the stories of, of regular human beings. Um, so how do we bring some of that narrative, the, the, the true costs of, of what it's like to be um, living on the margins in our society, how do we actually bring that into the law? Because it, it doesn't, legal reasoning and analysis can be very um, uh, rigid and formalistic. And that kind of reasoning has traditionally benefited people who have power, particularly men, particularly white men, rich white men. Um, how do we have a different way of thinking and being in the law that actually draws more from um, the people who are really experiencing a law? So the human lawyer was actually an attempt to, you know, this dialectic you described, you know, this attempt to, to constantly be learning in the law from ourselves and learning in ourselves from the law. So tell me a little bit about, um, so what you have, you have four minutes left. So I just wanted uh, to highlight some of the things that you're up to now. Um, I don't know if you're still challenging um, uh, cat money bail uh, in jurisdictions around the country or whether there are other uh, fights that you're taking on along with that. Talk us a little bit about what, what the 2021 looks like, if you can, about some of your, uh, your legal work. So we are still, unfortunately, litigating the cash bail issue six years after we brought the first case. Um, we are in a very difficult situation. I mean, the, the federal courts are a very, very hostile place for civil rights. Um, Donald Trump has appointed 40% of the federal appellate courts. Mm. And these are a group of people who, who um, have a sort of a visceral hostility toward the expansion of individual rights, particularly when um, those rights are perceived as helping the poor and people of color. And so we have to acknowledge that challenge. On the other hand, the legal principles we're litigating are so clear um, that one would want to believe that they would be vindicated even in those courts. Um, we're also litigating across the country in state courts. And you know, traditionally, I, I should say, after having made that last comment, we've done worse with Democratic appointed judges than Republican appointed judges. Um, in most legal jurisdictions, most large urban areas around the country are controlled by Democratic machine politics. Judges, police, mayors, city councils, county councils, county boards. Um, those people are very invested, as James Foreman has written very eloquently in his book, Locking Up Our Own, um, very invested in, and also uh, I should mention Naomi Murakawa's book about how liberals created the modern prison state. Um, the, the Democratic Party is very invested in police, very invested in cash bail, very invested in large uh, local jail populations. Not only is it very beneficial for the unions, um, police and corrections officer unions, but um, it's, it's, it's very beneficial for the Democratic Party base of real estate developers and, and others who sort of control uh, local city politics. Um, so in terms of litigation, we're actually litigating at all stages in state courts and federal courts. And um, I think in 2021, we're gonna continue doing that work until um, we um, and our partners, it, organizers all over the country, figure out a way of fundamentally changing the way ordinary people think about these systems. Because I don't think we're gonna end up convincing the elites or that even if we won in the court, it's gonna end up really changing these systems. Um, the, if we won in court and the same people are in power without um, the, people who are most impacted by these systems having a say in it, they're just gonna create a new system that does many of the same thing. So we're still litigating that. We're also embarking on a really exciting um, uh, project uh, around policing. Um, we're continuing to do our fines and fees work about the rise of modern debtors prisons. And we're continuing to, to sue prosecutors and to promote prosecutor mis mis misconduct accountability across the country. So we've got a lot of really exciting things going on. Um, we're still continuing some of our work on behalf of people who are incarcerated during the COVID pandemic and, and the incredible brutality that's been an indifference that has been shown uh, towards them. So we have a lot of really exciting things going on and maybe we can reconvene in a year and, and check in on how they all are going. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Al, thanks very much for the conversation. Um, this was exactly what I wanted it to be, was just sort of unpacking 
uh, a little bit of uh, what we started to get to in the film. Um, like I said, there was a lot of positive response um, to your work and your point of view uh, that I heard personally about your work. And so I wanted an opportunity not only to highlight uh, the book, there it is folks, a little small book, um, not a, not, it, it goes by fast, but it will make you think hard. So it's not like Dr. Seuss, but it's not like War and Peace either. So there you go. Um, but, uh, uh, but just wanted to highlight what you've been up to, talk a little bit more about sort of how you came to be, uh, where you are and what you're doing. And uh, have a great holiday and hope we can do this again uh, sometime in the new year. Thank you so much for giving me the space to talk about the book and, and hopefully some of you all will get it for a holiday gift. For I'm giving life. it for holiday gifts myself. I'm buying a whole bunch and I got to get you to sign mine. So we'll do that when the pay <laughs> So there you go. All right, bro. Great. Great to talk to you. Thanks, for, thanks again for taking the time. Thank you. Bye-bye.